a little slow today. Huh? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 2. As we continue our study of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the law, whatever word or name you want to apply to it, we have found Christ in everything. It doesn't change. In fact, this morning, some of you may have seen, seen uh, some teaching of mine or someone else's that identifies what we're going to see this morning, but to others it may be very curious, and interesting, and eye-opening. Numbers by name, as I mentioned last week, Numbers is a dull title. It really doesn't apply because it's really only the first chapter or two that deals with this counting. It's really the time that Israel spends in the wilderness, approximately 40 years or or 39 years or so here that we're going to be uh, going through in this this writing, Numbers. Whereas last, last time we were in Leviticus, it only is about a month or so the last part is just flies by in time, but there's a lot of detail in God giving them instruction in the offering of sacrifices. Last week, the Lord told Moses to count the men above the age 20 and those that were able to go to war. So you think that's just boring. But we're going to see how unboring that is this morning. The number of men were identified by tribe. And you can infer that in all the different tribes, there's going to be a very close percentage of men and children to the men in all the tribes. So we're going to use the tribe numbers to paint a picture of Christ and the cross this morning. Not not that we're going to, but God already did. It draws this very interesting picture. But we're going to ask for the Lord's help uh, in in this this morning before we get started so let's pray father we thank you for preserving this record for us that we can see your hand your plan your love your grace but also as we see that you are a faithful and just god who desires repentance so speak to us this morning as we see your hand at work in israel during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So we begin in chapter 2, verse 1, as we continue now. And people have been counted. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard. So you got the armies laid out, identified by a tribe, the, the, the army by the subdivisions. So each children, now all the children of Israel are going to orderly camp around the tabernacle by their own standard, their own banner. We use banners. I, I go to, when I was younger, we had the kids playing hockey and each team had their own banner that they would make up and they'd have contests and who had the best banner. But it identified who was there. So you knew who you're playing against. Well, they are to camp by their own standard, each tribe, beside the emblems of his father's house. So each banner had an emblem. So every tribe had an emblem that identified it. We we look at our lives and we see this happen. We have flags. Military has flags. They have divisional flags. They have different flags for different groups. So they can, number one, you can identify them, but also they, they stand proud behind that. And they identify with it. Well, they, it says there, they shall camp some distance from the tabernacle of meeting. We're not told how far they, they, they established that at that time, but we're not told how far. So in the middle, you have the tabernacle. What We have a, a, a model out there of the tabernacle. And the area around the tabernacle, they're to camp back away from it. And we'll see why in a few min- minutes. But each tribe has their emblem. Strung between two poles, more than likely. They're to camp together in groups. First they have their tribes, and now God is going to bring them into troops. It's, going to, it's for order, number one. But it's also, good, he's going to get, lay out for them the order in which they are to march. They're to march by tribes as they move out, when God moves them from one location to the next. So, 
they were not to, they didn't just camp together it was very orderly so the pattern that God is going to lay out here is what we're going to be really focusing on in verse 3 on the east side toward the rising of the sun those of the standard of the forces with Judah. That's a key word, with Judah. So it's not just Judah. There's going to be others with them. Shall camp according to their armies. And Nation, the son of Amminadab, shall be the leader of the children of Judah. And his army was numbered at 74,600. When we go back to chapter 1, that is the individual who was identified as the overse- overseeing the army of, in this case, Judah. Now the leaders mentioned are the ones... In, from chapter 1, verses 5 to 15, remembering that these are the men who are older than 20, ready, that can go into army. Those who camp next to him, this is a, a real um, weak English translation. Those who camp next to him shall be the tribe of Issachar, and Nethanel, the son of Zuar, shall be the leader of the children of Issachar. And his num- army was numbered at 54,400. Then comes the tribe of Zebulun. And Eliab, the son of Helon, shall be the leader of the children of Zebulun. And his army is, was numbered at 57,400. So the word here that's used next to him, and it, and it sets up the whole pattern, doesn't mean next to him. And we're going to see a picture here in a minute of what some people perceive that to mean. It literally means yoked to so they're tied together in that sense. They're going to camp together. So this idea, don't, don't think of it them next to each other. That's, that's a misunderstanding of it. So these three tribes encamp together as a group. So now that is called a camp. The camp of Judah includes those three tribes. And as, as these three collectively are going to be called the tribe, I mean the camp of Judah, And Judah, however, is going to be the closest to the tabernacle. All these details mean something, as we're going to see. All who numbered according to the army of the forces with Judah, so that's his camp, 186,400, these shall break camp first. Let's go to the slide. So you have here the order. And I'll explain why it would be this way instead of widthwise here in in a little bit. So we have the banner the Judah, a banner of Judah was the lion. And this is also part of where we get the, the description of the, the Messiah is from the tribe of, he's the lion from the tribe of Judah or the lion of Judah, lion of the tribe of Judah, whichever combination you want to look at. So next in verse 10, on the south side shall be the standard of the forces with Reuben, according to their armies. And the leader of the children of Reuben shall be Eleazar, the son of Shadir. And his army was numbered at 46,500. Going clockwise now. Now, don't, don't do the slide yet. Go back there. We'll get to that one. Those who camp next to him, yoked together, shall be the tribe of Simeon, and the leader of the children of Simeon shall be Shal- Shalumiel, the son of Zerushadai. And his army was numbered at 59,300. Then comes the tribe of Gad, and the leader of the children of Gad shall be Eliasaph, the son of Ruel, and his army was numbered at 45,650. All who were numbered according to the armies of the forces with Reuben, the camp of Reuben now, 151,450, they shall be the second to break camp. So he's given them their location and the order at which when they move, how it moves. It's orderly. It's not this massive group of people just kind of heading out. It's going to be very orderly, and partly because they will be ready for war if they come against an enemy. So let's go to the next one. So now we have Reuben, and his his flag was uh, was the man, had the emblem of the man. So they had their tribe and the emblem of the man. Next, we address the center of uh, area around the tabernacle. We'll get into more details of that at another point, but. Here in verse 17 it says, And the tabernacle of the meeting shall move out with the camp of the Levites. Now the Levites end up around the middle in the blue area there that you see. And there's some significance in how they're laid out, but we're not going to cover that this morning. But they're in the middle. So it's going to be Judah, 
then Reuben, then the Levites. Now, if you notice, it didn't say the Levites were the camp. It is the tabernacle that's at, at, at the point here. Because the Levites are the ones who are taking care of the tabernacle. They're the ones who tear it down, put it up. And within the Levites, also you have the priests. And Moses and Aaron and the priests and the high priest. So they're encamped around the tabernacle. But it's the tabernacle of view. So it's actually the first two tribes, then the tabernacle that moves. And by the way, the Levites are the ones who are overseeing it. So Levites are not the focus, but the tabernacle itself. And then in verse 18, on the west side shall be the standard of the forces with Ephraim, or Ephraim, according to their armies. And the leader of the children of Ephraim shall be Elishema, the son of Amihad, Amihad or Emahad. And his armies were numbered at 45,500. Next to him, yoked with him, comes the tribe of Manasseh, and the leader of the children of Manasseh shall be Gamaliel, and the, the son of Paduhazer. And his army was numbered at 32,200. Then comes the tribe of Benjamin, and the leader of the children of Benjamin shall be Abidin, the son of Gideonai. And his army was numbered at 35,400. It's very significant. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces with Ephraim, 108,100, they shall be third to break camp. So let's go to the next slide. So you have on the, on the west side, you have that group of people. Now these are all proportional. These little, this graph I have, each section is proportional to the number of people. Their camp, uh, carrying the banner of Ephraim in the front toward the tabernacle, was the ox. So that represented that camp. Then verse 25, the standard of the forces with Dan shall be on the north side according to their armies. And the leader of the children of Dan shall be Ahizer, the son of Amishadai, and his army was numbered at 62,700. Those who camp next to him, yoked with him, shall be the tribe of Asher, and the leader of the children of Asher shall be Pagael, or Pagael, however you pronounce it, the son of Okran. And his army was numbered to 41,500. Then comes the tribe of Naphtali. And the leader of the children of Naphtali shall be Ahira, the son of Enan. And his army was numbered at 53,400. All who were numbered of the forces with Dan, 157,600. They shall break camp last with, with their standards. So let's go to the next one. So we have their Dan. It's very interesting because initially their banner, their, their emblem was the serpent. Later, it's changed to the eagle. And we'll talk more about that at another point. But to think about that okay, as we go through this. The tribe of Dan is going to be quite a problem in the future. So we're going to see that even after they enter the promised land. Verse 32, these are the ones who were numbered of the children of Israel by their father's houses. So this is the numbers, the groups, the camps now, four camps. All who were numbered according to their armies of the forces were 603,550, but the Levites were not numbered among the children of Israel, just as the Lord commanded Moses. Thus the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord commanded Moses. So they camped by their standards, and they broke camp, each one by his family, according to their father's houses. So a very orderly process. What we saw were small pieces. Now, some have attempted to draw this. Let's go to the next one. To draw this encampment. But there's a problem with this because the sizes of the armies are too great to try to spread them out wide and narrowly thin. It just wouldn't work. They would have to be so far away from the camp to do that. The other thing, uh, the other problem is that God is very literal. Remember, when he says east, he means east. If you went to a rabbi and said east, and you were northeast, you wouldn't be east. They take God's word literal. So to be east, you have to be east. And so that would, only, that would account for and align the tribes going out in the direction that I showed them. 
Now, are you ready for this? This is a more accurate view. Now, this is a view that might look like, go ahead to the next one, from a hill. Very interesting. This is somewhat proportional. But let's go to the next one that really shows the proportions. Isn't that interesting? You might say, well, that's kind of a coincidence. Ask any rabbi. There are no coincidences. The word coincidence doesn't exist in Hebrew, and it certainly doesn't, isn't found anywhere in the scriptures. There are no coincidences. Prophecy, God prophesies by patterns. He's very orderly, and he's very concise. That way we know it's him. We don't have to guess. And I so many times say, God has not asked you and I to have blind faith. He has shown himself over and over and over. And his exactness shows us that he knows the beginning or the end all the way from the beginning. And we see this as we're going through Revelation. We go through the prophets. Prophecy is God, is man, God using man to tell the world that what he already said is going to come now. He's already forewarned that the world is going to go through a judgment that we are beginning to see coalesce. Now, we thought it was coalescing, and it was beginning back in the 70s. We thought the European common market was the 10 nations. Well, it never went to 10, and God is too exact. So it couldn't have been that, and now we know it wasn't that. They may be, the European common market is no longer that. Now they have the European Union. That could be one of the 10 groups, because the United Nations in their agenda 2030, first 21, 2030, it's not new, it's been around a long time, but they've finally worded it. That's why the Agenda 2030 has divided the world into 10 economic zones, the whole world, not just this little group. So when we were thinking it was Europe, we had to create all kinds of ideas about, what. then what does this mean, and what does this mean? God is too exact, so when he's exact, we don't have to worry about it. We know it's going to happen like he said it is. So the Agenda 2030 is, is um, well, actually, the Green New Deal and all of those environmental things are Agenda 2030 being put in action in different places. So when you hear about the Green New Deal, you haven't heard about it as much, but you are hearing environmental things, but that's all tied to Agenda 2030, and its basis is to control the world. Ultimately, it's for Satan to try to attempt to affect and take souls before Christ's return. And so we have this whole idea of the agenda 20. Now, could God do something else? Yes. Does it fit more accurately? Yes. But God, there could be a whole other organization that pops up that does exactly what God says. So we're, we're trying to figure out what God already knows. And sometimes he doesn't give us enough information and it keeps us humble, number one, but it also keeps us on our toes. We need to be ready. So we have this picture that is not a coincidence. If, you, uh, if that wasn't enough, if you would, turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 1. Let's go to the next picture. Okay, this picture actually shows just together, so we see them, uh, the different banners of the different uh, camps. Ezekiel chapter 1. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to highlight a few verses. You can go back and read the whole book. It's incredible. I just I like to call Ezekiel, thus says the Lord. You know, it's just God is declaring He's going to do now what He told, what we already read some of before when we were in Leviticus finishing it out. Is the blessings and the pro, the blessings and the curses. God has already said, if you're not obedient, these things are going to happen. And He's going to reiterate that. And then the prophets come along and God says, okay, tell them it's time because they haven't repented. Or if they don't repent, I'm going to do this. So his judgments weren't surprises. They were fulfillments of what he's already warned Israel from the very beginning. Verse 1, this is Ezekiel prophesying now. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives in the river Chibar, they're in captivity, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. This is the beginning of Ezekiel. Now go down to verse 4. And you can again read that other part later. Then I looked and behold a whirlwind was coming out of the north. 
a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and a brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a likeness of man. Each one had four faces and each one had four wings. Okay, now let's go down to verse 10 and we're going to see who they are. As for the likeness of their faces, each one had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Does that sound interesting? That's not all. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 4. Coincidence? You have the tabernacle of God and the four flags around it are represented what are, what are they representing? Chapter 4, verse 1, Revelation, last book of the Bible. And I just, I'll use this as an opportunity to remind you if, you. if you don't have them and you're not sure what, where the books are, we have some dividers on the back right behind the last pew that you can take and put on your Bible because we do use the Bible. And it helps and saves time if you know where they're at, the different books are at. Or quick references. Chapter 4, verse 1. And we went through this a number of weeks back as we're going through Revelation on Sunday evenings. After these things I looked. After these things, the things of the church. He is now brought up. And behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet. Not a trumpet, but loud. Speaking with me, saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must take place after these things. After this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Let's move down to verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal. We went through that. Uh, again, symbolized or, or foreshadowed, and a, certainly a small picture in the uh, laver on, in the tabernacle. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. These living creatures, might notice it doesn't say angels. You might identify them as some sort of an angel, but they were beings that God created. And they were around the throne. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. It would be an ox. The third living creature had the face like a man, and the fourth living creature was the flying eagle. Coincidence? I don't think so. I'm like the rabbis. I don't believe in coincidences. God was giving Israel, as we saw in the entire tabernacle, every part of it that he gave details of, pointed to Christ and gave them a picture of what the throne room of God looks like. Just a tiny one that we could fathom, that we could grasp in this body. We can't grasp this other dimensional realm. Just because it's more than one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. It goes beyond ours. The four living creatures in verse 8, each having six wings, again the six wings were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying holy, it doesn't say singing, it says saying, holy, holy, holy. Three holies. Every time you read it, it's holy, holy, holy. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Holy, 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 Lord, God, Almighty. I remember that just by holy, 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 as though they were three individual persons, but they are one. Lord, God, Almighty. That might be translated into the Hebrew as Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, the mighty God who was, who is, exists, and who is to come. Still yet to come. So he is coming back. Prophecy is a pattern. We have here God laying out the throne of him, his throne room. Small glimpses. We saw this through our study of Exodus and Leviticus, and we identified these different things. 
But let's ask you a question. As they're trying to describe what they see, Ezekiel and John and, and Jeremiah, all the, when they see these pictures that God has given them, a glimpse, they're trying to help us see, understand it. So they're picking words from their point of reference at the time, because that's what the people would have identified with. So it, the, a, the beast looks like, let's pick one of them, an angel. I mean, I'm sorry, an eagle. Which came first? I've said this numerous times. Which came first? The angels or the eagles? So is it possible that him trying to explain to us that it looked like an eagle, that actually God made the eagle look like it? That he gave us animals that look like creatures and beings that are already in heaven, giving us even more glimpse. Because we know the lions will again, as they once were, won't be eating people and animals and such. They're going to be lying in peace with us. But this idea, sounds crazy, it's just a thought. But when you think about that, God has given us things. Look at the trees, the beautiful surroundings. There is a, the tree of life, just as an example, is in the New Jerusalem. It's, it's, it's right there in God's presence. So we have trees around us. Glimpses of what, God, what is in heaven. So when we think of things, think of it that way. Think, wait a minute, I came later, so what am I really to understand? God has given us glimpses of his beauty and of, of being in his presence. We're just touching the surface here this morning. There is so much to this whole picture that God has given of his presence. And what a privilege it would be to be in his presence. To encounter and see the real thing. The finale, or the, I'm sorry, the, the actual things he gave us pictures of. Hard for us to comprehend. It must have blown John away. Even Ezekiel and Isaiah, they all were, have been seen the presence of God, seen that picture. There is only one way. We know that if we've been studying our Bible, but there are people who haven't heard it and don't know it. There is only one way into the presence. Here we have on the east gate, that's the, on, the east side is the gate. The only one way in to worship God. Which tribe is in the front? Judah. The priests are between Judah and the gate. That's the entrance through the lamb. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus Christ. The whole picture is laid out here with the Cross, let's go ahead and go back to that last picture. I think we have. No, I'm go back forward, I mean. There we go. The picture is there. God was already declaring there's only one way. He already promised that, that way was coming through the Messiah. Temporarily, he gave them the offerings and sacrifices to temporarily cover them until the Messiah came. When they died, they were held in Abraham's bosom, is the, the term that people use. It was in this Hades area in Abraham's bosom until Christ came because they had temporary covering. When Christ came, he covered them and us and everyone who puts their trust. The ones who believed in the coming Messiah but realized they hadn't seen him, but they were trusting God was going to provide him, those were the ones in Abraham's bosom because they were going into the true tabernacle at a certain point in the future, through the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah. Only one way into the holy place here and the fulfilled, the true one. When Christ comes, he becomes our kafar. We saw that in Leviticus 4 and 5, the kafar covering. So our sins are, gone, are not even seen by God. We are justified, made just as if we have no sin. And we'll find it. Just as a finale, turn with me to John chapter 14. We're going to close early so we can keep the next part in context. John chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus himself declares this. Now this whole chapter 
summarizes, or, or I mean develops this, but he begins in 14.6 when people, you know, basically he was being asked, you know, that how do I get there? Jesus said to him, I am, I exist, literally, as the way. I exist, I am the truth. I exist as the truth. There is no other truth. And the, I exist as the life. Not just any life. The life, the eternal one, the continuing one. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can that be any more clear? I don't think so, but there's many today, even behind pulpits, meeting even today and Sunday mornings, who teach otherwise. And again, I've said this numerous times, and it's not something I came up with, but I do hear over and over that all roads don't lead to God, but they do. Every path will lead you to God. The question is when you meet him, where, which direction you're going. What is your eternal destination? There isn't anyone that is not going to come face to face with God. All roads lead there. But there's only one way to the Father. And that is through Jesus Christ. Verse 23, let's go down and, and finish it up. Verse 23. Jesus answered and said, of John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, if anyone agapes me, he will keep my word. Not an option. It's not like one day I will, maybe I will sometimes. If you love Christ and declare your love for Christ, you will keep his word. And my Father will agape him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He's in us. And we're going through that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 this coming week. Some surprises in there. If all you've read is the English translations. We come to, they come and dwell in us. We've been talking about that in chapter 12. This oneness, John chapter 17. Read it where Jesus says, he is praying to the Father that you and I will be one as he and the Father are one. It's not a metaphor. There's much more to that. But they're going to make their abode in us because we are his body and continuing his work. Verse 24, here's the opposite. He who does not love me does not keep my words. He's laying it out pretty, pretty sternly. Yes. You love me, keep my words. You don't love me, don't keep my words. If you're not keeping my word, you don't love me. It's pretty clear. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. No one can enter the presence of God except through the line of the tribe of Judah, the high priest, our high priest, through the holy veil that he rent. He was the veil, and his body was rent, and it was symbolized when he died, the, whole, the veil of the, whole, the temple into the Holy of Holies was torn from the bottom, atop to the bottom. It was ripped apart, letting us know we now have access to the very presence of God, and his spirit dwells in us. We should ponder that all week. What do we do with that? Just go around our lives and it's kind of like, okay, if I get in trouble, I'll call out and cry out to God, please, help me. No, I, mean, I, I know some of you have done that. I think we've probably all done that. But we have the privilege, not only of entering at a certain point in the future, the very presence of God visibly, but he's in us. Now, he is dwelling in us. And that should cause us pause when we plan our sins. You must trust in the sacrifice. That's what faith is. It's the trusting in the work of Christ on the cross. That, when it talks about faith, is what it's talking about, trusting. That Christ's offering was enough to get you into heaven. And in that trusting, if you love him, you're going to follow him. You're going to keep his word and his father's word. Let's pray. Father, what a picture you've laid out for us. 
even in this seemingly innocuous book of, the num of numbers, yet you have cried out from the beginning, even from the garden, even from creation. Your love for us, your desire for repentance, and the picture of your redemption, your plan to redeem all of mankind. May we ponder that this week and keep that on our hearts. That you chose to create your body and dwell in us individually and collectively to further your work to save souls. May we be faithful with what you've given us in your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation and free.